Looking across history, there are quite a few individuals people would deem as heroes. Some people look to their country's founding fathers, a beloved wartime commander, or a martyr who died for a cause the individual deems just. One such a martyr I personally find fascinating is John Slaferian, Kansas bleeding, God fearing, motherfucking Brown, the man who fought a personal war on slavery. John Brown was born in 1800, the son of a Connecticut cattle breeder and leading citizen Owen Brown. His namesake was actually Owen's father, a captain who fought and died in the Revolutionary War. If that's not some destiny shit, I don't really know what is. His early life experienced a shakeup when his family abruptly moved to Hudson, Ohio, the most base location in early 1800s America. Hudson was a center of abolitionist rhetoric and debate, the nexus in the Underground Railroad. Owen Brown himself actually volunteered his house as a safe house for slaves. All this had an impact on young John, making him feel like bringing down slavery was a duty of his, although he had not yet become violent in his ideas. His religion also had a major impact during his upbringing, with his family belonging to a radical sect of Congregational Protestants. They seemed to be the only group of Christians at the time who had actually read that little-known part of the Bible, uh, you know, Exodus, the part where slaves rise up against their masters. In this way, the church reinforced what John's parents had already taught him, ingraining in him a strong sense of determination and justice. After all, he was doing the will of God, so how could there be anything wrong in pursuing abolitionism? They say the most dangerous man is one who thinks he's right, and to the slave-owning human garbage at the time, that was certainly the case. Owen Brown had been one of the founders of the Western Reserve College and Preparatory School, but soon seeing the religious-based institution get weird and cult-like with their pursuit of so-called Christian perfectionism, the Brown family formally withdrew from both the school and their local church, and this young John learned the value of questioning institutions that seemed unjust, even one as seemingly sacred as the church. Eventually, Brown found himself returning to the East Coast for an education, studying in preparation to gain entrance to one of the prestigious liberal colleges of New England. Sadly, health problems prevented him from pursuing further education, and they end up wandering up and down the eastern seaboard, finally taking a wife and settling down in Pennsylvania. While there, he started to grow into his ridiculous God-given superpowers, more or less single-handedly building himself a homestead on the 200 acres he had purchased in the countryside. He cleared multiple square miles of forest, building a cabin, a barn, and a tannery. The estate was special, as there was a hidden purpose to it. Throughout the compound, there existed many secret compartments and passages so that he could ferry escaped slaves towards the more tolerant northern states. It was a major stop on the Underground Railroad, marking its place in history from 1825 to 1835. During that period, Brown aided in the passing of an estimated 2,000 Five hundred slaves. Jesus Christ, the man just didn't stop. He went on numerous more exploits during this period, but I'll only list a few for brevity. He remarried, ended up having 21 kids, and hopped along the countryside, freeing slaves. He was appointed postmaster by President Andrew Jackson, and when asked to drive Native Americans out of the area by his neighbors, he instead broke bread with the tribes, maintaining peaceful relations. Brown later found himself in Springfield, Massachusetts, the mecca of anti-slavery activists at the time. Brown was a member of the Free Church, where he witnessed abolitionist lectures by the likes of Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. In 1847, after speaking at the Free Church, Douglass spent a night speaking with Brown, after which Douglass wrote, From this night spent with John Brown in Springfield, Massachusetts, in 1847, while I continued to write and speak against slavery, I became all the same less hopeful for its peaceful abolition. My utterances became more and more tinged by the color of this man's strong impressions. During Brown's time in Springfield, he became deeply involved in transforming the city into a major center of abolitionism and one of the safest and most significant stops on the Underground Railroad. In 1850, the United States passed the Fugitive Slave Act, a law mandating that authorities in free states aid in the return of escaped slaves. In response, 
Brown founded a militant group to prevent the slaves' capture, the League of Gileadites, a reference to a biblical Jewish militia dedicated to defending their borders. After the founding of this group, not a single freeman was recaptured in this area, as Brown would intimidate or outright raid them in order to secure their freedom. The final of his adventures was a less exciting homestead he set up in New York, although it was almost equally important for the cause. Recently, a few philanthropists had been donating land to freed black men, and so Brown went there to help them be self-sufficient. Years later, he would be buried there because of his attachment to the area. Now, we get to the period known as Bleeding Kansas. The Kansas Territory was in the midst of a state-level civil war from 1854 to 1860 between those who wanted and those who opposed slavery in the future new state of Kansas. The issue was to be decided by the voters of Kansas, but who these voters were was not clear. There is widespread voting fraud in favor of pro-slavery forces as congressional investigation confirmed. Brown heard about this from his sons who were living there and determined to protect his family and oppose the advances of slavery supporters, Brown left for Kansas, enlisting a son-in-law and making several stops to collect funds and weapons. Although initially optimistic about the area remaining peaceful, hoping a stockpile of weapons would dissuade violence in the area, the other side struck first, a pro-slavery militia burning several abolitionist newspapers. This thoroughly enraged Brown, and he took justice into his own hands. He denounced those who were too cowardly to fight for the cause, and rode out, massacring a group of Southerners in their sleep and winning battle after battle across the countryside. Eventually in the campaign, Brown had his homestead burned, a son killed, and two more captured. Like an absolute badass, his band of 20 men defeated a force of over 300, securing the release of his sons while soaking the soil in the blood of evil. Eventually, the governor of Kansas pulled some fence-setter bullshit, denouncing violence on both sides. Where, 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 where have I heard that before? Uh, but Brown knew then that he had to take decisive action, and so he took those who would follow him and rode out in a fury. Now, the raid on Harper's Ferry, as it would come to be called, was no new idea to the mind of Brown. According to historian Karen Whitman, Brown was doing research for his plan all during the 1840s and 1850s. While living in Springfield from 1845 to 1849, he studied maps of the South, underground, underground railroad routes, and census tracts to discover where the slaves were living. In 1849, he went to Europe on business and studied military fortifications in England, France, and Germany. Brown had read all the books on insurrectionary warfare he could get his hands on. He had studied Toussaint Le Overtures, Liberation of Haiti, and the history of Jamaica, those being major slave revolts. And, beginning with his conversation with Douglas in 1847, Brown purposely solicited the support of black leaders in the planning and execution of a massive anti-slavery undertaking. Now finally having men and money gathered from local sympathizers, he began to execute his plan to incite a massive slave revolt. He planned to seize Harper's Ferry, a local federal armory, and then distribute the weapons to local slaves. His band of 21 marched into town with no resistance, as he'd had Harriet Tubman, yes that Harriet Tubman, scout the area for him previously. They took the armory easily, but an issue arrived when the train got word to the feds. The resulting fighting, once Robert E. Lee arrived in command of the U.S. Army, was brutal, and yet for a few hours, the raiders held position, killing several pro-slavery locals. However, it soon became clear their position was doomed, and Jeb Stewart approached under a white flag and told the raiders their lives would be spared if they surrendered. Brown refused, saying, No, I prefer to die here and now. Eventually, they breached the walls, and he was captured, albeit only after it took several men to take him down, one of which he bayoneted. While he was finally captured, and later hanged, his impact was felt greatly before his death. From his cell, he wrote hundreds of letters, and before he died, he gave a great speech condemning slavery. The man was dubbed a terrorist by some, and yet his actions led to emancipation, so I am honored to call the man a hero. 
fucking based. Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 1910 so true. He frightened old Virginia till she trembled through it. They hung him for a traitor, then sells a traitor crew. His soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His soul is marching on. John Brown died that the slave might be free. John Brown died that the slave might be free. John Brown died that the slave might be free, but his soul is marching on.